Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors Podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with myself, Jackie Jones, and the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll notice that Bob's in a different setting. He's moved position. Um, And if you're not watching it on YouTube, go and have a look. (laughs) So what we're going to be talking about on this episode, Bob, is what I've learned from my clients, which over the years that you've been doing this, I would imagine you've learned a lot from your clients. <laughs> I've learned a lot. Yes, I am a, I am in a new room. I mean, one of my rooms downstairs, actually, it's the major room where the TV, television is. And behind me, people on YouTube, I'm really talking to and people who aren't on YouTube can always go and rush and look at it. But behind me is some of my favorite things and pictures and one of my favorite yachts on the left hand corner. And it's a much brighter room, which is really why I've moved downstairs. That's what we like. A bit of sunshine and a bit of brightness. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Okay. yes, it's a great title. I mean, I I know I choose these titles, but I do particularly (laughs) like this title. So, um, I was thinking where I'll start that. I've learned so much, but I'm going to start with, I think I've learned over the many, many, many years, and it continually amazes me how resilient people are, how resilient people are, and how much they want to get better. Yeah. You took the words right out of my mouth that I was going to say, if there's one thing that I've took from all of my clients is their resilience. Yeah. Mm. So, uh, and the second one, people might say that seems a strange one to say when I say they want to get better. I mean, I always know that, of course, but the real determination that my clients want to achieve in terms of um, having an enhanced, different quality of life is really, really... um, not only amazing, but very privileging to be part of. Yeah. It's interesting that you said that. I I was talking with a client this morning about something, and it it kind of makes sense that people come to therapy because they want to make a change and they want to move on in their life. But moving on can cause grief and loss. So it's not always an easy decision to make. So you know, it, it's easier to just stick with the familiar, even if it's uncomfortable and painful. Mm. Yes, it is, and um, it takes a lot of courage to come to therapy. Yeah, yeah, and it takes even more courage, really, to stay with it in therapy. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Mm, mm. So coming to therapy in the first place is pretty amazing. Staying in therapy and often going to the challenging, maybe darker places they they inhabit or visit when they're in script particularly, takes a lot of um, resilience and courage. Yeah. It's interesting because I, um, I went to therapy last week. I get um, free eight free therapy sessions through wow. Macmillan wow. because of my cancer diagnosis. Oh, right, well, yeah. Um, and it was very strange. That's all I can say. It was strange. Was it useful? Um, I'm I'm reserving judgment on that. Especially when you're sp- <laughs> <laughs> especially when you're sp- speaking on a podcast that goes out to lots of people. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, that doesn't bother me. I, I, I'm quite open to showing things. It was person centered, and um, um, yeah, it was it was different to what I maybe would have chose if I was paying for it. Put it that way. Yeah. Yeah, and I think person centered has its place, and also it's very different from many of the psychodynamic models or transaction analysis from that point of view, which yeah. I know you know well. 
I'm just not sure what my therapist would have learned from me <laughs> in that session. Um, but yeah, it's interesting, you know, looking at it from a different point of view, from kind of being the therapist and sitting in the, the opposite side in a, a therapy situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So resilience, courage, uh, real determination to get better. Those are the things I'm often left with, or I've learned, if you like. Yeah. On a much more practical level, of course, I've learned things like things that I did wrong in therapy. Yeah. Usually because they tell me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, or they don't get better, of course, and leave. Um, and, and, and that's really important that we can learn how to be in different ways if need be. Yeah. And it's the clients that usually tell us that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's something that I put down, you know, maybe not necessarily what I learn from clients, but my clients encourage me to keep learning. Oh, good. Tell me a little bit more about that. That's a good one. The, you know, it, I'm always evolving as a therapist. It's just because I did my training, you, you know what I mean, and qualified in 2016 or whatever, it's like that's not it done and dusted and just keep doing the same stuff over and over again. I'm passionate about evolving and learning continually as, yeah. a, as a therapist. Yeah, and you learn more from your clients than anywhere else. Yeah, absolutely. What, Like you said, what works and what doesn't work, you know what I mean, what what resonates with people and working out if if putting things one way doesn't work rather than just keep saying the same thing over and over i need to find a different way of getting this across to them yeah yeah so they teach you that really don't they yeah yeah and then with the help of supervision you can perhaps decode what they're teaching you yeah yeah I, I I think it's a it's a journey. Everything's a journey all the time. Yeah. It's never an event. No, unfortunately. It's not it's not, you know, you do your training and that's it. You just keep doing the same stuff over and over again. I think each client as an individual, you learn something from them because they all come with unique life experience. Mm. Yeah, you can kind of categorize people as anxious or depressed, or do you know what I mean, vulnerable, whatever it is. But they're all unique in their own way. That's certainly right. So perhaps that's another thing I've learned is how similar and different people are. Yeah, because even you're right. Even though the same, often the same presentation maybe same patterns maybe same connections but they are of course or their story is as well uniquely different yeah and maybe they've they've also taught me whether that's the same as what i've learned from them is not to well to be aware of stereotyping people do you know what oh. i mean I was yeah. thinking when you were talking then about the age of, of my clients, do you know what I mean? That if they're older than me or younger than me, sometimes I have preconceived ideas on how old they are, how they're going to present in the therapy room. Mm. And the reality is it's never what I expect. <laughs> That's true, because people are different, young, old, um, different, they're just yeah. different. They're different. Even though they may have similar stories, their experience is always different. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. And as well as learning in terms of mistakes and things that I could do differently and the things I've just said, I also learn what I've done well. Yeah. If I take time out to just stop and congratulate myself, or even both of us congratulate each other, but if I take time out to recognise what works well, it's it's as it's as important as it's what doesn't work well, if you like. Yeah. Do you actually ask clients for reviews? No. <laughs> Never have I. Oh, oh, in terms of your no, it's not something I do per rote. By the way, 
I've done it in terms of um, a therapeutic treatment. In other words, in a sense of the unmet need of mutuality in, in um, the building of a therapeutic relationship in the process where a person needs to feel empowered, um, when a person needs to experience that the significant other is person is human and can make mistakes. Okay. So I've done it within the therapy treatment, but I haven't done it in terms of a supervision exercise or something like that. Okay. Because some sort of modalities, <laughs> I'm thinking of CBT, they do like a, a, a form to fill out, you know, the, as in a number of one to 10, where are you now? And then in six weeks' time, they redo it again. So that there's kind yeah, of a that's progression the or something. Yeah. yeah, but that's the client focused, isn't it? They yeah. don't get a piece of paper saying, uh, you know, how did you go on with your therapist? And did the therapist XXX? And how was the therapist when you left? And have one till 10 in that way. Yeah, but if it's gone up, then you can kind of assume from that that you've done a good job. Oh, you were thinking of it that way around. Well, it's interesting. I, 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 that is one way to look at it, actually, what you just said. I don't necessarily think that's true, by the way. I'm not particularly a fan of what we call Core 9 or ID9 or all these different, um, often computer-focused, generated um, yeah. processes you're talking here about. And not necessarily because somebody puts themselves of 9 when they went out and seven when they came in is a measure of success, actually. No, me uh, neither. And I, it's not something no, I do. Yeah. No, but I I'm saying it because quite often, quite often people think it is really. I mean, at one level, you could you can put that into the computing and generate it all together and get figures. And I think in some ways it's very useful. Don't get me wrong. And some clients will adapt to you. Some clients will make behavioral changes. However, they're not really changed at a fundamental level. Yeah. They yeah. could put 10 in the level of adaptation, if you like. Yeah. Nothing's really changed. So one level is very useful. Another level, it not it it isn't always the case. Yeah. I think this is the thing with psychotherapy that always interests me is there's so many layers to everything. Do you know what I mean? It's filling out a simple tick form isn't necessarily a good judge of anything. It can be whether you got caught in traffic on the way there and you're not in a good state of mind when you walk in to, do you know what I mean? It's sunny outside and you're feeling a bit better. The the rules for me, and I'm, I'm saying it because when I started my therapy, I had to fill one out and, I can distinctly remember thinking, I'm going to have to fill another one of these out in eight weeks' time, so I don't want to put too high a mark because I'm going to have to make sure that it's going up. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was where my logic was, do you know what I mean? So I'll just go for the middle ground on everything. And I didn't really put much thought into it at all, so the actual statistics that they get from it are irrelevant. They usually, they usually serve the purpose for the people who pay the money to the organization in the first place. In other yeah. words, they need some levels of uh, behavioral change or some levels of yeah. behavioral outcomes that have been reached to show the organization that change has happened so they can get the funding. Yeah. Yeah. That's, what you, that's why usually they're there. Yeah. And, and many, I can think of some organisations who um, won't give, get the funding if those those sort of uh, reviews, if you like, haven't been completed and fed into a computer. That's number one. And yeah. secondly, if the th if the therapist, how can I put it, review keeps going down, all those things which show. Uh, XXX. It's useful for the um, supervisor to look at, the organisation to look at, but you know, it's not always the case. So, for example, a, super, a therapist that needs to perhaps confront for lots of different reasons could get very low score. Yeah, 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 absolutely. You know, it's like it's these 
these review forms are all around measures of success and failure. Yeah. And then they can be then the organization or whatever it is can be given some money. But again, that's that's subjective, isn't it? Mm. No. So I, th I thought you were talking about something else, which is to ask the client, well, how have we got on? Have I been what you thought I would be in this session? What, have, have I exceeded or de-exceeded your expectations? Yeah. Within the transfers or within the, what I asked, you know, how I answered earlier on in terms of the need for mutuality, the need for uh, strokes from a significant other, there's many reasons why I might ask somebody this in therapy. Because it's interesting when you think about it, because most businesses, because I'm in private practice, so I kind of run my own business, do ask for feedback. Mm, mm, that's right. And but it's one of those things that I don't really ask for because how do you ask somebody for feedback? <laughs> well, you're, you're in private practice. You're not beholden to needing any money from anywhere. Yeah. You might do, say, for your own interest on, you know, how you've got on or haven't got on. But actually, I think it's a false picture, usually. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, many of my clients have to go through what is an idealised phase with their therapist, which is me. And that might last from two weeks to 15 weeks. And now, all the time we're going through that phase, I'll get tens anyway. I might start doing it in the first few weeks. Yeah. And see what <laughs> in the idealised phase, which is a normal term of development. Yeah talking about and of course when they hit the transference and you drop from idealized i'll get north or minus north for 10 weeks yeah in the long-term developmental relational work i'm talking about yeah in the more short-term work and maybe for beginning therapists then these types of questionnaires or reviews can be useful in terms of a supervisor looking at what works and what doesn't work so I can I understand them, but I think they have their limitations as well. Yeah. So have you got any tales from the therapy room where you've learned something that's kind of stayed with you? Yeah, I have. I'm going to here mention a book. A book. Yeah, it's one of a really really well known book. Came out in 1989, I think. So when I started trained to be a therapist in 1985 it was top of the book list so it must have been 87 actually it's a long time ago but if i'm from a very well-known british psychoanalyst who i think is dead now but pardon me uh i went to see him and he was pretty elderly and so i'm assuming something it could well be like his name's patrick casement and he wrote a book called learning from the patient and then very creatively, as that was a massive hit, he wrote another book called More Learnings from the Patient, which I thought was a very creative second title. Absolutely. But anyway, <laughs> that book is great because he goes through a lot of his clients and talks about, you know, what he learned uh, in the therapeutic process um, from each of his clients. So it's a very good book. And I said it was very, very popular. The yeah. first book, particularly Learnings from a Patient, Patrick Casement. I've so I just that mention that because it's a really good book. Yeah. In terms of myself, did you say tales from the actual? Yeah, it's sort of a, a client that you can remember that really opened your eyes and, and maybe changed the way that you look at things. Well, it's nearly always... I'm not a particularly a client. I, I think... It, <laughs> Like I said when I started, um, resilience and courage of people who want to get better have always amazed me to their sense of uh, capacity to stay in the process. So in an evolutionary process that I've gone on in the many, many years, that's never ceased to amaze me. Yeah. Um, now... As I started to specialise in different areas, I was thinking things like 
some of the more disordered people in terms of things like multiple personality, which is now dis dissociative identity disorder. Um, and I've always been amazed, I think, around even though people can present quite ill, if they stay in the therapeutic process and they believe in it, they they often get they often can enhance their lives in ways which I would never have thought. Or yeah. stroke and learn to live their life uh, with more healthy coping mechanisms. Yeah. Because it, it, it's all about whether somebody's willing to invest in themselves, really, not mm. just monetary, but also time wise. It's not it's not a quick fix. I think nowadays a lot of us want to just go and get a tablet for everything <laughs> to sort out the symptoms, either to numb it down or to, to get rid of the symptoms altogether rather than putting the groundwork in. Hmm. Yes, that's what, probably why I'm struggling to find a particular client because so many clients who I thought might leave, you know, after a certain amount of time because the challenges were going to be so daunting in many ways in my head. Yeah. Have stayed the test of time longer than I thought, gone the extra mile. Yeah. Yeah. And that always amazes me. And it's taught me about the resilience of the human condition and also about hope. Yes. So hope can be a very, you know, negative word and positive word because people can hope and hope and hope and never do anything. Yeah. But also hope can be a very liberating word. Um, what about yourself? Have you, have, you, have you got specific cases that you can think of or clients you know, in this process that you're talking about? Because I've talked quite generally, I think, rather than I'd have to reflect and think a particular client that has particularly taught me something differently. There were so many of them in different ways. Um, no, I can think of one particular client. I'm, I'm thinking, because they were very late in my clinical life, and particularly disturbed. And I wondered, and this is, you see, this is happens to quite a few clients. You see, this is why I've kind of sent on this person anyway. And um, she was somebody who really did um, have very little protection about herself. And she was also quite split and fragmented. So you could say she was different people at different times. Yeah somebody who was quite paranoid somebody who had for a lot of her life um had suicide suicidal ideation and had tried to kill herself and came to my office in a very disturbed state and what amazed me and this amazed me for quite a lot of people is though they can be very disturbed and know they're disturbed and life is very difficult for them in their workplace they function very highly yeah it's not until they get to their emotional life where the disturbance shows itself at its highest so i used to be quite amazed at that and she taught me and so many other people have as well that People can function very well from an adult place. However, when they are in personal relationships or social relationships, which may demand they go to their younger self or their younger self is triggered off in the relationships by different things, um, they, leave a, they lead a very unhappy life. Yeah. It's really interesting that because I can think of a couple of clients where the, the same do you know what I mean that in the the outside world and in the work environment they've got quite high powered jobs and and function very well in that job mm. yeah so going back yes yeah, so that's right so going back to this client again what I learned of her was that 
um, I suppose if I stayed in the relationship with her and uh, was on her side and didn't frighten myself. Yeah. And stayed in the relational process I'm talking about, dealt, dealt with the developmental deficits, then things turned out really well. So after the two things, I suppose I learned for this particular client, not to scare myself so much if somebody tells me really what could be potentially dangerous situations. Yeah. And secondly, that she taught me to um, recognize that I did a pretty good job. I love that. I love the first bit of that, Bob, because I think that's something that a lot of us, me included, can fall into is that we overthink things and, you, you know what I mean, catastrophize and can eat quite easily scare ourselves. Mm. Yeah. It's not easy. Yeah, absolutely. Because quite often they're projecting their own scare onto the therapist, i.e., me in this case. Yeah. They're, they're projecting their own fear annihilation or they could hurt someone else onto the therapist yeah and it's not the therapist but they they often take it on as if it is yeah. and then they scare themselves for me and i'm not sure whether this will resonate with the listeners or or they'll agree with this but i i quite liked hearing you say that bob because in my mind you are above all of that so it's kind of showing a human side to you when you're saying it's important and I recognize not to scare myself when you know mm. some of these very damaged clients come so it's kind of humanized you a little bit for me thank you thank that, you're welcome and that doesn't take away the necessity for safeguarding yes I just want to say that I know I'm yeah pretty experienced and this was one of my later clients anyway so I've been around a long time but it but or stroke and I still took her to my supervisor yeah and we did talk through it in safeguarding ways and I remember talking to her about and requesting that she does certain things yeah to keep herself safe so I don't want the viewers to hear that you know that safeguarding goes out the window simply because um you know you you're not like, scaring yourself you're yeah you, yeah, 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 yeah yeah absolutely yeah. yeah um because it's very important to use a supervisor you, you know even if you've been around 20 30 40 years as a therapist um you still need a supervisor yeah for I these one... reasons for these yeah. very reasons, actually. Yeah, absolutely. Because when you're in the relationship, it's hard to look at it from an outside point of view. It's always easier for somebody else to do that. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that I've learned from, you know, a lot of my clients is to, to keep it simple. Mm -hmm. Good I one. think sometimes we can try to intellectualize everything and it, you kind of lose the meaning or it becomes too in-depth rather than just keeping it simple mm. well simple is more in this occasion yeah mm. and it's a very important thing you've just said there because um it's very common as well what you're talking about there for therapists to um especially as they get more and more experience and they read and read more books and especially if they have an intellectual tendency and especially if their ego takes control to to do all the things you've just talked about there and so to keep things more on the ground if you like yeah. and more simple is a very uh good thing i think yeah i, yeah, that, I think that's what i've learned do you know what i mean that, that if i do keep it simple i seem to make a better therapeutic relationship with them rather than yeah talking at them with all these big long words and everything and using real life examples or you know things that they can 
understand, especially in the early stages when they come and they're nervous and they don't even know how to be in a therapy room sometimes. You know, what am I supposed to do when I'm here? What's, you know, what do we do and things like that? So, yeah, I just try to keep it simple. Good. Another another thing I've learned very deeply, took a long time to learn it. Well, I don't know how long, but anyway. But it's okay to love your clients. Now, that took me quite a long time, usually, because uh, I remember in the early days, supervisors would say, oh, well, um, and start talking to me about my own sexual uh, feelings, maybe, or, you know, looking at my counter transference or um, talk about you can't touch clients or, it, or, or many other things. And I was made to feel the wrong for loving my clients or, relax, or actually um, in some way saying that to a client. Yeah. And showing my heart to clients, I remember thinking, well, I'm really wrong if I do this. Or at least it's seen from a supervision perspective that I was the one who was shamed for doing that. So, But I eventually started to learn, and from my clients, really, that it was so important for them to uh, explicitly hear from me that I cared about them. And they used to yeah. tell me in many different ways how important, because for many of them, they never had that from a significant person in their life. So it was a developmental deficit that really needed correcting, if you want to put it. But for me personally, to start to uh, give myself permission to explicitly tell clients I love them or care for them was something that not only did I, I think, I think it was my clients which really showed me the importance of that process. Yeah. I'm just thinking now whether I actually, I'd like to think I show them in my behaviour that I care for them, but I'm not sure I actually, you know, verbalise that and say it to them. Yeah. I think there's, with being an ex-foster carer, I think there's always a fear for me of it being misinterpreted or... Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's something, yeah. That's exactly what I'm saying. And especially if you take it, to, especially when I took it to supervision. Yeah. I, I felt quite shame. I used the word shame because I did. But I, I had to work through it. And I think probably in my career, I, if somebody had asked me what's the most important development in terms of helping clients get through really difficult times, it would be that I allowed myself to explicitly love my clients. Yeah. Which is a lovely thing to do and also difficult at the same time. Yeah, it was very difficult. And of course, I, I want to endorse again, it was... I changed supervisors largely because of it. Yeah. It was frowned upon about, oh, well, what does that mean? And here's this, that, the other. And yeah, I understand all the perhaps necessary debate, discussion, talk, or whatever you like. But at the bottom level is most of my clients, not if not all of them, but certainly most of them anyway, their troubles were usually, well, what was the bottom of their troubles was that they hadn't received mm. loves from significant other people or allowed themselves to even believe they weren't worthy of love from that other person. Yeah. I can definitely see the therapeutic value in, in doing it. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. And I, 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 I like what you said in, in the beginning. You said you like to think by sort of showing loving actions and care yeah no and that's probably too um sometimes i thought it was more important to explicitly say backed up by actions yeah what that means even an educative discussion if you wanted to put it that way yeah yeah because love 
you know, even just having that discussion in a therapy session about what does love mean to you? Because, you know, the idea of love can mean so many different things to different people. Oh. Well, we did a podcast, I don't know how long ago, I think it was yeah. only about four or five sessions ago, talking about love and hate yeah. within the therapy room. Yeah. So they go back and listen it. to that if you've not already listened to it. <laughs> yeah, so I, I've learned a lot. Um, I, I do think perhaps this is the biggest, actually, to be able to allow myself to um, show my heart. And look. And a lot of those permissions came from my own clients. Yeah. Yeah. Now, beginning as a beginning therapist, I was far removed from that. And uh, I didn't even think about it, I think. Yeah, I think overriding for me, and again, it's come from experience and, and you know, the confidence and all that sort of stuff, is that I've learned from my clients that it's okay to be me and I'm enough as a therapist. Yeah. Great. Yeah, that's a good one rather than pretending to be something that I'm not you know and I think that again comes full circle to the keep it simple because that's that's who I am I'm not an academic do you know what I mean but I seem to resonate with my clients and we do good work together yeah well that's a great quality to have yeah and I wouldn't change it for anything good and I expect your clients wouldn't change you for anything either. Hopefully not, because they keep coming back. <laughs> <laughs> so good. what we're going to be talking about next time, Bob, which kind of follows on from this quite well, I think, is how to prepare for your first client. Uh, you know, I'll have to think about this for the next one. I'll have to actually I won't in some ways. I know my I remember my first client as if it was yesterday. OK, until next time, Bob, hang on to that thought. OK, bye bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.